there was an earlier version of master's program and now is a new version of master's program in architecture design and this would be the fourth batch and this is the fourth version of the straight talk and what we have been doing is uh, in the in their first semester which we call as foundation pro program or the foundation semester the focus has been primarily on uh, on building up uh, their ability from tectonics point of view which means that they have been investigating build from from construction and structure perspective mm -hmm. and uh, in the second semester uh, there is a course which we do it's called theory and practice of details so in this course uh, we ask generally speakers from the indian subcontinent because that makes sense to us in a tropical climate how to practice but that same doesn't get valid in other climatic zones mm -hmm. and uh, and then, of course, the theoretical part we cover up. So the practice part is where uh, we have clubbed the straight talk series uh, with the focus on detailing because uh, because one thing we realize is that if we invite speakers to just present their work, it, it sort of ends up into talking about space, which is uh, devoid of how do you materialize it. Mm -hmm. And so if we push them to talk on details, then they start discussing space from, from that point of view, which is what our uh, shelf is interest is that eventually, uh, you know, uh, you need to start from the ground up. Um, yeah. So. Makes sense. So I think we'll start slowly. People will join, but uh, but let's uh, let's start the session. So I'll request who is introducing Meghna. Okay, Kosha, you can start. Very good uh, evening and a warm welcome to Straight Talk 2022. This year, the series invites speakers who are engaged with particular aspects of architectural design and production in their practice to throw light on topics that are central to the architectural process, profession, but, uh, but less discussed or theorized within academia. This year, the thematic focus for the series is architectural detailing in the realm of theory and practice. Uh, our speaker today is Samuel Barclay. He, after earning his bachelor degree in architecture and civil engineering from Lehigh University, went on to obtain his master's in architecture from the Southern California Institute of Architecture, SIAR, in 2004. He practiced in Los Angeles with Studio Works Architect before moving to India in 2006 to work with Studio Mumbai and co-founded Case Design in 2013 with his wife, Erika Bakke. In addition to his experience in the design and construction of architectural projects, he has worked on furniture, interiors, and exhibitions, and founded the brand Case Foods in 2015. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, it's uh, an honor to be here. We appreciate the opportunity to, to share the work of our practice and, and our collaborators. Um, it's also lovely to be a part of uh, a series of talks like this with um, you know, a handful of other architects whose work, people I know personally, but also people whose work that I uh, admire and respect. So thank you for that. Um, the title of my talk today is, is The Craft of Collaboration. And one of the things I wanted to kind of stress in terms of, especially as it relates not just to our practice, but the way that we work and, and the work that we produce, um, is this the, the notion of how to engage with uh, craftspeople of all different backgrounds. We work a lot with, obviously, carpenters, masons, uh, plumbers, electricians, the people who are normally a part of, uh, you know, the act of, of architecture. But we also work with farmers, we work with climate engineers, we work with visual artists, we work with weavers, we work with people who use natural pigments to dye materials. And one of the huge reasons uh, for me, uh, I came to, to India for the first time in 2003, so almost 20 years ago, uh, I moved here in 06 with, with my wife, Erica, that you'd mentioned. And uh, part of what attracted me uh, once I got here and has sort of kept me here uh, is the, the kind of 
depth of skill and knowledge that exists and the culture of building and making in here. And a huge part of that is this notion of tacit knowledge. The idea of something that's rooted in context, experience, practice, values. It's something that's learned through communication, through dialogue, through engagement. Um, and for, for us, that really becomes uh, one. There's this sort of tremendous, once, once you recognize that, you, you see this tremendous pool of, of not just talent and experience, but um, truly, truly uh, deep knowledge that goes back uh, for generations in many cases. And so for us to have access to that and to be able to engage with it, what we found and the reason for the name of the talk is that there is uh, obviously craft in a lot of the, the skills uh, that we engage with in the product process of making, but there's also a craft in learning how to communicate with people. Traditionally, the way that architects communicate with people is through making drawings or making samples. And we do those things. Obviously now we add, uh, you know, digital modeling and 3D uh, rapid prototyping. Those things are there and they're great and they're part of communication. But for us, the, the craft comes in where you, you pay attention to the type of engagement that you have. Um, this is sort of a first example. We were working on a house in uh, between Oman and Dubai and we wanted to build that, uh, make that building out of rammed earth. So the construction workers that we had sort of uh, engaged with, as we were working with them, they got excited and they started talking about their own houses where they grew up uh, in actually in Afghanistan. And they started literally making a model for us of the way that their homes were constructed. And so to not just be able to be there and observe, but then to have a conversation with them to help understand their way of making the knowledge that they had and then see if there was a way to bring that fold that into our project and see how uh, that could inform not just the the detailing but the structure the the way that things were would be built and then obviously later, obviously later on experienced so bringing that back to to Mumbai um, obviously we you know I love the culture of workshops I grew up sort of in and around workshops. I love, you know, tools and timber and being able to work with things. Obviously, the ability that we have to, to, to sketch and then turn those sketches into prototypes and wood and then to have those then translated into metal or the final material. For us, that manifests the most um, directly kind of at the scale of, of objects. Uh, as I said, we work with, with these uh, craftsmen who go back uh, 60, 50, 60 generations. Um, and so that the, the tacit knowledge, the skill that they have, the under Sam, you have to unmute. Yeah. Have I been muted this whole time? No, 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 just last. 10 seconds. Oh, okay. I don't know what happened then. Um, anyway, good. Uh, so uh, having access to these kinds of artisans and craftspeople obviously alleviates us from needing to know there's, you know, this, this kind of running joke that architects are uh, jack of all trades and a master of none. Um, we have to engage with people from all different kinds of backgrounds, uh, both socially, culturally, uh, experientially, um, and economically, and, and really sort of understand where they come from so that we can communicate with them in a particular way and then figure out how their ideas about how the thing that we obviously we have to we're the generators as architects we are the generators of the concept we are the generators of the idea how it needs to perform how it needs to function but by working with them and the skills that they have and first of all first and foremost sort of finding them finding the ones who you know if i need to know about color i might go to a visual artist or i might go to somebody who mixes pigments or paints if i need to know about timber obviously i'll go to a carpenter but finding the right person, finding the right team, understanding what's relevant and appropriate within that context, 
um, and then trying to take those things and manifest them in the ways that support your vision, but with all of the other layers of, of understanding that those types of people have. So in our practice, the, you know, we do everything from, this is a collection of furniture, lights, objects, things that we've produced and we sell under a separate brand um, that we've created, case goods, which you mentioned before. We then work on architectural interiors, which you know, start to begin to engage with materials in a very deep way in the expression of space and surface and texture color, all of those things. This is, a, an, again, an image, and, and if you remember the very first one, but, you know, this is one of the carpenters that we work with, and this photograph is a drawing that he's made. He's the one holding the pencil. He's the one holding the scale. We're engaged in a dialogue, and so I've, as best I could, expressed the intent, the idea, how the window needed to sit, and then he understands the joinery, how the glass needs to be fitted, how do we keep water out, how do we, you know, plane or polish the surface in a particular way? So it truly has to be a dialogue and it really requires that engagement. So no matter what number of, of drawings or models that we make or produce, the way that we engage with them is not explicitly through those means, but it's through conversation and a sort of back and forth. And then we go, we take that dialogue, bring it back into the studio and then adapt and update our drawings based on how those how those things manifest. So these are some examples of interiors, more about you know, materials and details, things like that, but different things that have evolved through that process. So here you can see a kind of, uh, you know, the, the, some of the palettes that we work with, the materials, uh, reclaimed timber, mosaic, terrazzo, um, you know, brass, custom light switches, handles. And so for us to, to be able to work at that scale is, is in a way the laboratory that we use to explore ideas with those um, particular finishes and materials. And then we try and take that, what we've learned, and as our, our studio grows and, and develops to take that into the, the scale of architecture. Um, this was one of our first projects. Um, some of you may have seen it before. This is uh, Avsara Academy. It's on the outskirts of, of Pune. It was actually the first project that we had when, when the practice started. It's um, a residential school for young women with a focus on leadership and social entrepreneurialism. It's founded by Rupa Purushottaman um, uh, and it runs as an NGO. Uh, and what we realized on site was one of the first fundamental things that we had to do was to secure a source of water. There was actually an existing excavation that was there on the site, but there was no, all of the water otherwise would have had to come from tanker trucks. There was no, um, we weren't allowed to put in a bore well. There was no municipal line. And so we really um, sort of, we brought a master well maker, if you remember the first image that was uh, those people engaging in a conversation about the construction of this well here itself. In addition to that, one of the things that we wanted to do obviously was to have some kind of a, a landscape, uh, both as an environment, but also as a productive landscape. And so all of the water, if I show the master plan here, all of the water, this is the well here in the, the corner, so that first photograph previously. But the water that is used to irrigate the landscape, all of it comes from the water that goes down the drains in the school. So everything from the showers, the sinks, all of that is collected. It's filtered through in these reed bed filtrations here, these rectangular volumes with the plants. There's one here, there's one here, there's one there. And there's an 18 meter slope from this corner of the site to this corner, the highest point is here on the top right. And at the bottom left is the lowest point. And there we've put in a polishing pond, which is the kind of last layer of filtration process. The solar uh, rays come and, and aside from the sand filter, the charcoal filter, the reed bed filter, the last one is, is a UV filter. And that water is then pumped up to the top and is then irrigated, used to sort of move just through gravity through the site using these very, very simple 
uh, kind of ancient waterways that are built in as part of the structure of the boundary wall. So again, engaging with local farmers, what were their practices, obviously a landscape designer, uh, Hemali Saman, um, and trying to find out what is, what is simple, what is practical, what is efficient, what is cost effective, and to kind of weave those three, those things into a sort of larger holistic experience. Um, the girls of the school are, are just incredible. They, they sort of bring everything to life. Um, it's, as I said, it's a residential, it's a mixed use residential and day school. So uh, it's designed for about 700 students before the pandemic, they were right around 350. And obviously they're sort of rebuilding those numbers. Um, the first class graduated uh, two years ago and some of them have gone on to universities both here in India, but also uh, a few have gotten scholarships in the US and Canada as well. So it's, it's quite successful as, a, as an institution. And one of the things that we, along with the, uh, obviously the water resource management was the, this idea of um, energy consumption, passive cooling, we worked with a, a climate engineer called Pratik Ravel from TransSolar. And even just using kind of general uh, building principles and, and studying the, the local architecture as well, we knew that the, the idea of verandas and the idea of cutouts, especially to the north side, where we could reduce the FSI that we would need to build, as well as sort of have, the, or sorry, open verandas to the south side to sort of cut the solar gain into the classrooms and sort of absorb some of the, the heat gain into those more uh, outdoor spaces and protect the enclosed spaces of the classrooms. Um, we also used a lot of reclaimed and recycled materials or, or waste material. This image on the left, um, some of you may recognize is a photograph of uh, the work of an architect named Picciones. He, he developed the steps to the Acropolis in Greece. And all of these are different kinds of marble. And he had these incredible intricate drawings of all of these different patterns. And I, I actually showed this photograph to the mason that we were working with, um, Rameshwar Bhagwa. And we wanted to create something along these lines, but I said, how do we do this on no budget? So he, sort of talked about this idea of getting wastage from stone shops, from quarries, from places where there was off cuts or, or you know, this sort of extra material was generated. And basically for the cost of transport, we could get the material. Um, and then it became a little bit of extra work to kind of craft the, the pattern or the look that we wanted. But by engaging with the people laying it in conversation, as opposed to being making explicit drawings, no two places are the same. They all have different patterns, both by the nature of the material, but also by the person, the hand of the person who's laying it. And so you get this unbelievable kind of patchwork of, of these different uh, patterns and slight variations in color. Most of it is, is um, either kota or kadapa, but there's a few marbles mixed in, there's a few granites mixed in. You kind of take what you can get and work through. Um, the other thing we realized was that we could get for the cost of a brand new door in composite materials, aluminium, synthetics, plastics, things like that, we could get an old Burma teakwood door from a, a building that had been demolished. And so this was a mock-up that we were making to kind of figure out. We found a place where in Mumbai where they had salvaged 80 doors from an old school. And as long as we were comfortable kind of, again, dealing with the irregularities in that, trying to put them in pairs and sets and choreograph the kind of arrangement in the various spaces, um, we could have something that had a little bit of life, a little bit of character. Um, it wasn't brand new, but it still had this, this sort of really beautiful richness to it. Uh, along with that, we realized very quickly, the client had asked us to, to provide furniture, to provide cubbies, to provide um kind of pieces where the girls could store their bags in between classes things like that and not only was it a kind of space constraint in terms of occupying the passages and hallways and verandas but we found actually that the cost of marble slabs was less than the cost of plywood and so we could produce things that were more hygienic 
better maintenance, easier to clean, more durable, all of those kinds of things and had a sort of quality and we could integrate them within the wall thickness. So we we're in addition to that saving on material by not having to produce, to put bricks into those spaces. And so these were sort of samples of, of that process. Here you can see the results. The walls are made from uh, recycled fly ash bricks. It's a it's like it's a kind of arid, aerated cement, but they're made from industrial waste uh, that's recycled and, and uh, turned into this kind of product. And we were able to get again because it was an NGO and the, the client had some very good connections in, in various industries. We were able to get them at least partially donated. So we laid them in these sort of long, thin coursings. And again, we had to figure out how do we strip away as much as possible. You can see the exposed conduits on the ceiling. We didn't plaster anything. There's there's no plaster really at all in the, aside from waterproofing in bathrooms and things like that. But really trying to strip away all the layers of of not just extra cost and expense, but things that in places where it wasn't uh, even that necessary. So I had mentioned uh, Pratik before, and, and you saw the photograph of the veranda before. This is that veranda here, if you see in the sketch here in the, in the middle. And uh, Pratik had introduced us to this idea of, of solar chimneys as a way to kind of uh, manage some of the climate control. We wanted to avoid having mechanical air conditioning, not just for the environment, environmental impact and energy consumption, but also for the, the long-term operational cost of it. Um, again, it's for an NGO, all of the scholarships are, are funded through donations. And so we really had to have a kind of, not just a low cost of construction, but a low um, uh, operational cost as well. So the idea of these solar chimneys is basically that you have uh, to the north side, you have a solid massive concrete wall that just stands on the rooftop. And then you, you wrap that on three sides in basically a greenhouse. And the idea is that the sun heats up that concrete slab that creates uh, convection, which draws the air up through the shaft. And at the ceiling level of each of the rooms, so these each of the floors has dormitories on two floors of dormitories on the top. And to the, the bottom two floors have academic functions, be they offices, classrooms, whatever they might be. And uh, at the ceiling level of those, there's an opening into the central shaft. So the only extra cost in terms of construction was that in the center of the building, you'd have a double wall instead of a single wall. It's separated by 600 millimeters, about two feet. And at the ceiling level, you have those openings and that draws the air out. On the upper floors, the fresh air is drawn in through, through doors and windows that we've uh, put in for the dormitories. Uh, you can do that also in the classrooms, but what we also have in the lower level classrooms, especially, are the, the idea of these earth ducts. And what they do is that to the north side of the building, uh, we planted vegetation here. That vegetation gets watered typically in the morning. That creates a little bit of humidity. That cool air is then drawn into those uh, pipes. It turns around in the core of the building in the center. So from here, it would come into this. Sam, you're on mute. Sam. Why does this keep happening? Just a few words, so you didn't miss a lot. Okay, I don't, I appreciate you interrupting. I don't know why this keeps happening. Anyway. Um, so that fresh air gets drawn in at the floor level. It's then mixed with, with very simple ceiling fans. Um, you can see here. Uh, and so that's really the only mechanical cooling that we have. The research that we did uh, in testing this was that the temperature difference in certain, certain times of the day, certain times of the year was between five and nine degrees, which is a significant difference. The idea also of keeping the, the roof slab, the ceiling slabs and the floor slabs, both in masonry, but also exposed, is that they, uh, they act as thermal mass. And because this valley outside of Pune has a, a significant temperature difference between day and night, and you have the passive cooling operating throughout the night, those slabs are then recharged and can absorb the heat 
the next day, but when you come into the classrooms in the morning, they're cool and fresh. Um, as I mentioned, the, the paving, the same was true with the flooring. We, we got marble from different parts of Rajasthan, this beautiful green and pink and yellow from, from Jaisalmer. Um, and again, worked with these artisans and craftsmen to kind of lay those. We also worked with, uh, I'll come to in a minute, but a visual artist named Malena Bach and, and a young woman named Dwani on my team to develop different color palettes and, and different uh, sort of, to again, choreograph um, different mixtures in different spaces so that it gave the, the girls a kind of visual identity that they knew that the ceiling in their dorm was yellow and that the, the girls on the floor below would have green and their math class was in the pink room and they might have uh, you know history or science with uh with a mixture of you know green and yellow um so these are kind of the manifestation of those again very 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 bare bones budget from the foundations all the way through the furniture we had to build this for about 2500 rupees a square foot um, including the landscape, including transformers and all of the sort of mechanical requirements, things like that. And so really a huge part of the design was, was trying to fit things within the budget. I mentioned Malena, she's a visual artist from Copenhagen. Uh, I had worked with her before in Mumbai when I was with Studio Mumbai. She and I had kept in touch and we were talking one day and, and she was thinking about coming to Mumbai and just to visit and I said oh we're working on the school and is that something that you'd be interested in so she got very excited she was interested and so she very um you know donated her time and her ideas and energy and, and created this beautiful palette of colors just using local pigments oxides things that we could find in the markets in Mumbai created this custom uh palette of of different colors that you know, through research and testing, each one relates differently to the landscape, to the space that it's in, to the colors that are there on the floors. And what she, the way that she describes it, um, while it is uh, ostensibly and technically it is a paint that she's come up with, but it's really a, a material. The color itself is a material. It, it, it takes on the shape and form and texture to some degree of, of what it's applied to. So you still see the exposed foam work of the concrete slab, but you can also see in these images that it has the, the, the hand of the artist, uh, the, the, the brush strokes of the application. And she worked with, with these artisans, again, learning from them. So we were learning from her. She was learning from us. She was learning from them. They were learning from her. And so, again, through this, this dialogue and this engagement is, is really what made this possible. Um, similarly, we, we were asked to create some of the furniture, again, the idea of what can we take from recycled materials or low cost materials or things that otherwise might be salvaged. And so the idea of creating a terrazzo from, from broken glass, um, these are, you know, all of these different colors come from, you know, kingfisher bottles and, and uh, you know, different bottles of juice and wine and all these things, but that otherwise just get thrown in, in the bin. So we were able to get them, you know, smash them into pieces, grind them to the right size, and then again, work with, with uh, artisans to, to create these sort of large, beautiful surfaces. So um, this tabletop, which is made up of sort of three of these massive terrazzo slabs, uh, we designed, um, you know, obviously these very inexpensive marble bookshelves. And you can see this is an example of the, the grill at the top, just a really simple, uh, aluminum grill that works as the connects to the solar chimney on the roof to help exhaust the hot air. Uh, the bamboo screens also aid in that um, in that process. You can see the part that we think about and work out in the studio, and then going actually to the home of of one of the craftspeople that I've worked with for a long time, uh, and making mock-ups at his house with his knowledge about everything from the time of year and time of day and time of month that the bamboo needs to be cut, how it would need to be treated, how it could be tied, and then leading to how that gets manifested on the facade. So these screens act as visual privacy, they act as um, a little bit of defense against wind and rain, they act as solar shading devices, so they're kind of, um, the, the, 
the treatment of the facade is somewhat graphical, but it's also um, intentionally more dense in places where you need more privacy, dense in the southwest corners where you need more protection from the rain. And so understanding that kind of calibration of how these um, things need to work together, again, at the large architectural scale, but also at the, the, the detailing level. Um, shifting climates, uh, although not, not so much. Um, this was a, a project in Zanzibar that we completed uh, a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic. Um, Zanzibar is an island off the coast of Tanzania in East Africa. It's incredibly beautiful. Uh, it's made almost exclusively out of coral limestone. So basically calcified coral. Uh, it's very porous. Um, and you can see here, this is, this is the edge of the site. So this photograph is taken from standing on this cliff looking out. So this is at low tide where the, uh, the sea recedes pretty far out. And this is all very shallow kind of tide pools and, and sea urchins and octopus and, and all kinds of uh, beautiful small creatures. Uh, at high tide, the water level comes up to this line. So you can literally jump off of this cliff. You can see this is eroded because of the waves that crash against the edge of it. Um, and then this is what it looks like standing on the, on the edge of that cliff. So this tree, if I go back, whoops, if I go back one, this tree here is this tree here. And all of this, this was before the project started, but all of this is uh, basically barren rock. Um, there's no soil here at all. And so the, the plants that survive have to be extremely hardy and extremely and, and, and manage in, in very little to no soil. So again, we wanted to engage with local people who lived on the island who had expertise. This is Franco, uh, Franco Gosa. He's a permaculturalist and he and his, his wife, uh, Bernadette, um, run a permaculture design company in Zanzibar. This is the client Shehab on the left. And so one of the first things we did on site was establish a nursery um, using the practices of permaculture. So um, permaculture is basically the way to produce, to have a kind of long-term sustainability without the use of chemicals, where you can use, you know, uh, life cycles of plants, life cycles of animals, our engagement with them, you know, chicken, chickens produce <laughs> excrement, that excrement is useful when fertilizing, the chickens also sort of eat certain, certain kinds of insects that are somewhat harmful to the plants. And so you can sort of create this biodiverse ecosystem, there's the chicken house right there, Franco is very proud of that. Uh, you can create this very uh, biodiverse ecosystem with polycultures and things that, you know, the idea of growing bananas produces a lot of biomass. It doesn't produce a lot of, there's not a lot of cost to it. You then can cut those down, use that as compost. And very quickly, we literally grew soil um, as the architecture was being developed. So we were also working with a landscape designer based in New Zealand, somebody that I'd collaborated with years before again. This was this kind of landscape plan for the site. So this is that edge of that cliff with the ocean beyond. The original idea was to develop a small eco resort. Um, Shehab and his, his partner Adil, um, they were old friends from, from Dubai. They wanted to produce a series of guest houses that they could use uh, for themselves and their family when they visited, but they also knew that they wouldn't live there full time. So they wanted to have it um, sort of rentable. Um, and so, again, this was the initial master plan. We produced a series of, of units, kind of two or three bedroom units that would be, so a bedroom here, bathroom in the back. Again, the idea of verandas. Um, he was very adamant that people should sort of sit, not in their rooms, but outside in, in shaded spaces or communal spaces. They should be visible to each other. So he wanted to encourage people coming from different parts of the world to sort of interact and engage with each other, which was um, a really exciting idea for us as well. Um, again, in our studio, building physical models, these are at one is to 50, getting into the details of the landscape and how those things would, would interact and engage with each other. These are pictures in our workshop. 
Um, and then understanding again the local local materials. Um, concrete, for better or worse, as it was with Absara, was a kind of um, I don't want to say a necessary evil, but it, there was an ease of means to it. Um, there was an efficiency to it. It was part of the contemporary building culture. Uh, while we do recognize its impact on um, you know, air quality and the production of, of cement in general is not ideal, we tried to use it kind of as sparingly as we could and, and efficiently as we could. And so a lot of the exterior cladding is using this local uh, coral, which is again taken from the basically the surface of of the the island it's um you can see in certain places it has this very beautiful kind of corally pink color and other places it's this very very kind of creamy almost chalky white uh engagement again is is critical for us so we had an architect working with us he worked with us in the studio for about a year he was from italy originally and then he moved to zanzibar uh, to manage the construction of this project. He was there for two years. We sent two or three other people from time to time. I would go myself every two to three months during the construction process. And again, working with engineers to design a cantilevered staircase, working with the masons to develop the details around the coral. But again, we didn't invent this pattern. This was something that we saw somewhere and we found the mason and we brought them here and kind of put together using their experience and their knowledge and tried to find a relevant expression from our background, what the clients wanted, and to sort of put that all together in a holistic way. You can see again the, the beginning of the landscape and, and the integration of, of the permaculture as well. We brought, this is Malena again, so we brought Malena into the project also. Uh, this is Bernadette, Franco's partner, who's working on the landscape here. And so those two things were coming up kind of hand in hand. The, the planting was going on, the nursery things were growing and maturing in the back. We were also training um, young people from the village to learn and work in the garden so that they could understand how the, how the things were planted, how they were cared for. And then that became, we, we approached the local uh, Shea who nominated young people, students to, to sort of have these kind of work opportunities and then they would have out of that um, training period, they would then have jobs as a part of the um, as a part of the project later on. Um, again, really simple boxes just in the landscape. We worked out the interiors as well. Um, this is Ariel Huber, who's a photographer from Switzerland, who's most of these photographs, the good ones anyway, are his. <laughs> um, he's a very talented architectural photographer. A lot of the furniture was made in Mumbai or Alibag and shipped over. Now uh, you can see this is Malena working in the nursery. So again, the sample room, uh, we didn't have the benefit of Malena's talents. So when left to uh, myself, the boring architect, you end up with gray. <laughs> so this was the wall for the sample room. We made all the switch plates uh, in our workshops in Mumbai, um, but you can see once Malena arrived, we started to get into much more richer and diverse colors. The palette here you can see is, is very different because again, the sunset is different, the landscape is different, the colors that you get in the market are different. And so all of that informs how these things are manifested. Uh, this is basically IPS. It's a local version of IPS, but a, a cement screed that's applied with pigment. And you can see how in the bathroom spaces, we have these open to sky courtyards, but we use this material for the interior finishes. Um, again, the combination of colors from the, the white stone that's there, so the pink coral, greens and blues. So each of the rooms has, has quite a different uh, flair. We also brought uh, two masons with us from, from India. Um, they flew over with me um, to work with the local uh, team there. Uh, one was an expert sort of in the plaster technique. And so it was trying to understand the best practices between what we would do here and what they would do there with local materials. Uh, at one point between Simona's Italian, my English, Swahili being spoken on the site, um, and, and obviously a bit of Hindi, um, there were just <laughs> all kinds of languages. But through sketching and dialogue and samples, we were able to sort of 
um, bring the ideas to the forefront. The other mason was was uh, very good in, in stonework. And it's a little hard to see here, but each of these tiles at the edge of the pool is very carefully cut from a single slab. And they have all these notches and grooves to allow for the drainage system. Um, and again, to, to while these masons all had great expertise in being able to sort of do this, um, this kind of uh, polygonal pattern with the coral, they didn't have great expertise in working with kind of thin granite slabs. And so we wanted to sort of put all those pieces together. Eventually they sort of developed their skill set, And now we've, we've been excited to hear that they've now gone on and done other projects with these skills as well. So it's nice to, to sort of see those things um, manifested in other ways. Um, so if you remember, I'd mentioned Franco and Bernadette, they became uh, the permaculturalists. They became good friends of ours. And, and soon after the project was kind of winding down, they had told us that they recently purchased a piece of land also on the coast, a slightly different part of the island. But they wanted to build a house for themselves um, that was completely off the grid. And so we started looking at um, solar power is, is fairly um, uh, efficient there, obviously, with uh, it's in the tropics. But the other thing that's advantageous for them is uh, the, the rainfall. So they get a similar amount to Mumbai, um, but it's spread throughout the year. So they have a, a, a heavy monsoon in, for two months in May and June. It goes a little bit into July and then another one in November. But even in between those times, they have occasional showers. And so while in India or most parts of India, the storage of the rainwater becomes an issue, for them, we, we imagined anyway at that point that we would be able to do rainwater harvesting. Uh, so solar power, rainwater harvesting, solar water heating, reed bed filtration, and completely on their own since the project began, they've also developed, um, they're installing a biogas plant. <laughs> so really, truly off the grid. Um, we started to look at local villages and be inspired as we did for at, at Kizikula as well but look at the, uh, the local villages and be inspired by the way that they address the, the road, the way that they socially engage. The other thing that we saw though, again and again and again, was the idea of the courtyard as a way to sort of protect um, an internal space uh, within the home or well, an internal outside space within the home and to sort of wrap the, the program of, of a domestic environment around the space. That also worked really well for us with this idea of collecting water. And so if you see these dotted lines here, all of the roofs basically form a funnel that brings you to this courtyard here. And then in that courtyard, we'd have a pond and that pond would obviously collect water and then take it to a cistern. So a really simple plan, uh, kitchen here uh, to the back. This is the veranda, the sea is, is to the top here, master bedroom, a study, guest room. Um, one of them has adult children that, that visit from time to time. And again, so this is sort of the view when you walk in, you see the courtyard here. This is a model that we made and then you see the sea in the distance. Um, so as I mentioned, the, this idea of collecting the water, understanding not just the amount of rainfall, but the the mathematics of understanding how much size quantity we would need to, to provide uh, water for the number of people that would live there, the amount of water that would be required to water the landscape. Again, they're permaculturalists, so they wanted to have productive gardens, fruit trees, vegetables, salads, things like that that they could grow. And what was critical as well, you can see the distance to the, to the sea, that we had to very, very carefully measure the tides and understand. So this was this image on the bottom right is, is a pit that we dug. It's actually off the screen here, but a little bit further back behind the house so that we could see at the full moon, high tide, even in kind of after a rain, what would be the level of water that would come in relative to the sea. We also knew that the sea levels would be rising. So the cisterns that we're creating were about a meter and a half. The bottom of the cistern was about a meter and a half below that highest point. And what we found was that from the high tide point here to a pit that we dug here to the one that we 
uh, saw back here was it wasn't straight across. It was a bit of a curve that, that dipped back. So we knew also that the further back our cistern was, the more sort of leeway we would have. So all of these things, again, you can see the cistern sitting here below the space. This is the courtyard, um, that pond that we were talking about. This has become a little bit more formalized in terms of its geometry. Um, but the idea of these kind of inwardly sloping roofs to collect that water, the filtration, they really like the idea as well that the, the kind of the health of the plants and the health of the water body itself would be a kind of visual indicator uh, of, of the water that they were getting and, and the amount that they would have in storage. So it became almost a visual reference to, to sort of the well-being of, of the house. Um, they were really excited. We told them about um, gober floors <laughs> that, that we've done in some spaces in, in India. Um, and the idea of using lime mixed with cow dung to sort of pave a space, obviously an, an indoor space. So all the veranda spaces when the house is done will be paved with gober. And they liked also the idea of the ritual that, you know, once or twice a year, you get people from the village to come and there's a day or two that's spent in the sort of reapplication of this. Um, but again, that it's the idea of not a maintenance free house, but a, a kind of ritualistic maintenance that, that becomes part of the engagement with your neighbors, with the community. Uh, they were very uh, excited about those ideas. And then the kind of last layer to all of this, I mentioned cement before, is that we actually proposed to them that if they were willing to accept a certain kind of construction, that we could build the house without using one grain of cement. And so we started doing research on the idea of lime. We knew that coral limestone was the primary geological formation of the island. And we started looking around because traditionally in Stonetown, all of the buildings were made with lime. They were made with lime mortar, lime cement, lime, or sorry, lime plaster. Um, and so we started looking for places where it, was this tradition still around? Was it still viable? And we found that it was, which was really exciting. So there are still these kind of lime kilns that are there that are by no means industrial. It's literally like this kiln is, is you know, 20 meters away from the slaking tank. So the hot material comes out of here, that's immediately put into this tank that then overflows and goes into these sort of different sediment tanks to at the one at the very end is the, is the finest. And that's the sort of the thin putti and the stuff at the top is more coarse, use it for foundations and rough plaster. Uh, so this was the kind of quasi-industrialized version of this, uh, this practice, which, which does still exist. Um, and we found even doing more research, we were working with um, a, a kind of a project manager named Quinton Christian, who is from South Africa, who's a friend of Franklin Bernadette's. He, he runs a, a practice called Ecodomes Africa. Um, and in the research that we did with him, we found these places sort of in more remote locations, especially even on the mainland, where they would literally take stacks of firewood and layer it. You can see here, these are blocks of the coral limestone, and they would burn this for two, three, four days. And basically, you, the idea is that you take out all of the moisture out of the stone, and then once you rehydrate it, it becomes, becomes lime that you can use to build with. Um, so working with Quinton from South Africa, Franco and Bernadette, who Franco's from Germany, Bernadette's from the Philippines, but they both live in Zanzibar. Um, a young man named Noel from my team went there and, and uh, has been living. Um, we kind of, had, and the other person that we were working with is a lime master who's from Switzerland, who uh, I had met years ago. And so with all of these different parts of academic, tacit, learned, experienced knowledge, trying to put all of these things together and understand how we can make this. This is a kiln that was built on site for us. This is, if you remember the, the aerial photograph, so this is the obviously the ocean. This is the excavation for the cistern. And on site, we produced this lime kiln. Um, this is actually the second one. The first one failed, unfortunately, but the second one was successful. So this this fire was created on the inside. This was the, it had to be uh, continued to be uh, stoked for four days. And after four days, the lime in the center of it, the outer stones obviously are just there for insulation. 
but the inner stones were suitable for construction. So all of this was recorded, calculated, um, quantified, understanding how much we need to do, how much it's going to cost. All of those things are part of the equation of sustainability. I mean, it's, there's economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, social sustainability, all of these layers are there, but using the information, the knowledge that we got from people in that environment, people who had practical expertise from outside and through conversation and dialogue, um, we put all of that together. So this is just from a couple of weeks ago. The, the, this is the foundation. So there'll be a basement space, which is this one here. This where these one, two, three gentlemen, four gentlemen are standing uh, is the, the base of the cistern, which will be underground. That's now come up to ground level. So you can see these, this is even more recently starting to look at how pipes and overflows and ventilation and all those things will, will happen. We're also taking, uh, we're, we're, it's, it'll be a little bit of a trial and error, but we're gonna see if we can add in a kind of passive cooling system to have uh, a kind of informal air conditioning by taking, drawing cool air across the cistern and pushing that into some of the bedrooms. Um, again, just using our, our experience and, and uh, wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So I'll I'll report back on how successful that is. But uh, it's been it's been a really great project. A lot of incredibly hardworking, smart, and and um, well intentioned people with incredible spirit has have have come together to work this one out. Um, and then I'll I'll sort of wrap up here with with this last project. This is a house that we're building in Alibar. Uh, it's nearing completion now. We should be done, largely done, and actually in the next few weeks. Uh, it's it's a very simple kind of one acre site. It's for uh, a husband and wife that have two adult, uh, a son and a daughter, and now they have uh, spouses and and uh, people. And so they wanted to have again, it's a it's a weekend home. They wanted to have a place where they could come with friends and family and stay. So there's a sort of a main house here. They wanted to have, they're very sort of socially active. So they wanted to have a, a kind of really generous swimming pool here in the middle and then two guest houses here to the side. Again, we were fortunate to have an existing, at least the excavation for an existing well on site, um, which is just a tremendous uh, resource. And so we, again, to start at the start of the project, formalized that, made sure that that was, was protected and cared for. Uh, water in this, especially in this part of Alibag is, is scarce. Um, this happened right before the pandemic, the start of this project. And so these are actually models that I made while I was in, um, uh, I was with my family in Michigan during that time. And so literally, you know, cutting these out of <laughs> basswood and cork sheets and Ikea placemats and things. Um, and one of the things again, that we wanted to do as much as possible is use local materials. So this is black basalt that's from the region. It's provided by the, the Sarpanch of, of the region, the Panchayat. And the bricks also are from, you know, just around the corner in the neighborhood. And what we wanted to do, if you see the kind of the, the rough texture here, in order to reduce the amount of shuttering that we use in, in the, uh, the structural columns that exist, we did, we formed, each of the corners are formed with brick, and then the concrete is poured into that as, as left in place shuttering. So we limited the amount of plywood, uh, especially the plywood with the kind of formaldehyde coating on it. We limited that to a few places where we had kind of longer span lintels, but for the most part, all of the shuttering is left in place. This was something that we'd observed um, in a farmhouse we saw being built in Rajasthan. Even the, the paving that, that's coming up. So this area outside the veranda is made from the leftover, the broken pieces of the larger stone. So you've got this larger, um, again, very rough uh, stone. It's not even cladding, it's the, it's the kind of load bearing wall. Um, the broken pieces of that are used to make a very simple paving. Um, we integrated water, again, I mentioned is always uh, not just an important resource, but the practicality of it. Uh, Alibag has a lot of power cuts, so we wanted to have a water tower as a resource so that even if the power was there, 
wasn't there, that you always had a flow of water to the main house. Working again with a lot of the amazing carpenters and craftsmen that we engage with. Um, this is Dwani, who joined Case Design as an intern um, about seven and a half years ago. Uh, she worked a lot with Milena and really became a sort of expert in these different color techniques from, from, from paints to plasters to IPS to lime to all of these. And so this was a lot of the research that she did to develop the, the color palette for the house. These were test cubes with the powders and, and sort of all of the kind of development of that. Again, working with the skilled craftspeople that we have uh, to, to sort of apply the, the IPS to the wall. We wanted to sort of, again, limit the amount of, of metal and actually even timber in this case, because it was, uh, we had a certain cost constraints. So there's a simple inexpensive, like a gray marble putty that runs to separate the IPS from the rougher plaster above. You can see how that kind of traces through. So this is again, just a wooden float that then gets painted with a simple color. The lower parts are IPS that become seamless with the floor. This is all of the curing process obviously. Um, mixing and matching colors, trying to put all these things together. This is a skylight over a shower in one of the bathrooms. Um, and yeah, seeing this, we're, we're at the stage now where, where these things are, are all coming together. This was just last week, we're starting to sort of clad the pool with, uh, again, an Indian granite. Um, and you can see a little bit, they haven't painted the house yet, but simple corrugated sheets. Um, you can see the section here. We developed a really simple, just a lightweight steel roof. You can see the water tower. There's a, a roof terrace, so this door leads to that. Um, and trying to, again, maximize effect with, with, with simple means. Um, I just wanted to end this um, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, a friend and mentor of mine, Billy Sin, came and spoke uh, at the Women in Design Conference. She's an architect based in New York. Uh, and at the end of uh, her, her talk, her presentation, um, I'm paraphrasing as best I can, but she said that she's built a practice, she and her husband and partner Todd have built a practice that does not rely on a strategy, but rather a set of core values. And I really was, was struck by that and, and appreciative of, of that idea. Um, and it really resonated with me. And it's, so I think it's something that we strive to do, my partner Salim and I, and, and my partner Erica, my wife also strive to do in, in the way that we engage with people, be they clients or engineers or, or craftspeople or farmers or whoever those people are. And so for me, that, that idea, that approach of, um, you know, spending time overcoming the inherent trust deficit that exists between any people, especially when they're first beginning to collaborate with each other. We spend as much time and energy on that idea and overcoming those challenges than we do making drawings. Obviously, drawings and uh, are another form of communication that's critical. But if we're able to participate in a way that is meaningful and and gives the all of the the different agents in any given kind of opportunity, uh, a sense of purchase and a sense of investment, we've, we've found that uh, there's sort of no limit to, to the results that you can achieve. So thank you. I appreciate your patience and <laughs> listening. Yeah, now may I request uh, some of you can be on video and Sam, if you can stop sharing, then uh, you know you would be able to see the participants. Yes, of course. You want me to start, or you guys want to ask? Him? So I have few. I have some questions. So I'll come back, but let me begin by uh, by the fact that you were addressing a large group of students uh, who in some way or the other will be practicing or will be engaged in, in some way in architecture in some form. 
So even if they are doing research, they are practicing, and even if they are literally practicing, they are practicing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so looking at uh, the way you narrated the whole story, one of the one of the very uh, important component of that story which is coming is is the fact that you are engaging, uh, uh, you are trying to sort of work with multiple agencies uh, and there is a value to that collaboration okay uh, which which sort of you are trying to uh, bring about so now that the fact that the project that we have shown uh, there has been multiple dialogues with people uh, who are deeply interested in what they are doing and and we're somehow trying to bring things together for the benefits of the students and for the future practitioners, it is important to know uh, as, a, as a method of practice, what are the core values of collaboration? Sam? I think the, the first and most important is, is the idea of empathy and really understanding where somebody is, is coming from, what is, their, what is their background, what are they able to contribute, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, but to, to engage in a, in a way that is um, understanding and appreciative of, a, of somebody else's position and point of view. Um, uh, you know, for any designer, uh, curiosity is a, cure, uh, is a key uh, component to, to being a good designer, I, I feel. Um, and it's, uh, I think those two things, if you combine them, really allow you to engage with people in a meaningful way. You certainly don't have to. I'm not saying that this is the only way to practice uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that it's, it's served us well. And I think that it, it allows, even within our team itself, um, it, it allows people to have a sense of, of ownership of a project. Um, this is not by no means, uh, you know, the images that are, that are shown here, by no means am I the author of those things, right? At best, I'm the band leader, right? But I've sort of helped find the band, <laughs> find a guitarist over here and another person playing the triangle and somebody else on drums. But you sort of, you, you put all that together and, and if you engage with them um, in a way that's sincere, then it really, uh, people really step up and Avsara especially for me, um, but all projects at, at varying scales, Avsara was a, was a great example of that because if you come with honest intentions for a good cause and want to produce meaningful work, you'll have no shortage of people that want to, to collaborate. Yeah, I think um, beautiful response because um, because one of the fundamental questions which uh, we have been dealing for a fairly long time and which since last many years are getting dismantled or in some way have dismantled is this idea of authorship. Um, and uh, how do you give up the authorship for the larger whatever, I mean, you want to call it... Um, Empathy, you want to call it much more honesty, you, whatever you want to use the word, but the fact remains, it, and it's coming out very clearly and vividly, is architecture is a work of, is a community work of people. There are a lot of multiple uh, sort of agencies coming together and, and sort of doing it. And somebody is merely trying to orchestrate, trying to talk to everyone, trying to have an empathy to understand the bandwidth and trying to sort of go back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's not a, so in that sense, it's not a stroke, but for example, an architect in Yoke makes a gray uh, sort of wall, but the moment, uh, you know, the person with, with, the, with this lively color comes in, then, then it changes, okay? And, and it further brings uh, something which otherwise we are, own are not capable of. And this, this very acknowledgement, I think, uh, it's so beautiful. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. I never would have dreamed, like when I when we started working with Milena, I never would have dreamed to think about. She said 
we should only put color on the ceilings. We should only put them on the slabs, right? Everything else has its own materiality. It had the walls, the floors, they have all that already. Let's look at the ceilings and to, to sort of even that recognition, it wasn't that I said, hey, Malena, pick colors for the ceiling. She came with a spatial intervention that just like changed everything. Um, so yeah, being uh, thinking about design in a way that leaves room for that kind of thing is something that is also really important. Well, I have more to sort of, we can have a dialogue, but I would request you guys to sort of uh, ask some of the questions before maybe I can, I can get in. So someone, I don't want to be biased towards Jayashree, so that's not a great idea, but I, I really don't want to pick up who is going to ask the question. But yes, Jayashree, if you want to ask, I'm not stopping you. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, I have a question, but I think I'll ask it uh, at the end. I'm at the studio, I'm just leaving. So if somebody can take a question, I do have a question, but I'll ask at the end. Yeah, who is next? Vivek? Uh. You don't have to. You can otherwise tell me not, that I need just, to ask. Okay. <laughs> just, uh, just a curiosity about the uh, uh, when when we're practicing uh, in a, a context uh, like in terms of agency or, or in, in terms of uh, selection of the material. Like how how um, how to catch more of the contextual uh, understanding. Uh, yeah. In, in the practice so there's there's kind of two ways to do that one is is a, many of our projects start with research um and there's all kinds of whether that's going through our library whether that's asking people that we know who have some idea about that context whether it's google searches or you know following people from that place on instagram there's there's a sort of academic research but I would say that a huge part of it also, and this was true in Zanzibar, in Pune, um, you know, is to, to go around and, and, and observe, right? See what was there, you know, 100 years ago that, that still exists and why, why was it successful then? Is it still relevant today? Is it still appropriate? Um, understanding the context in that way why were villages made in certain ways in Zanzibar and how could that be relevant for an eco-resort that we're building in 2020? Um, and trying to sort of interrogate that and combine those things with, um, you know, what are the local building technologies? What are the practices? What are the skills that are available? Uh, if there are any, I mean, one of the things in Zanzibar we found was, uh, I don't mean this as in, in a derogatory way, but there was very little skilled labor that existed. There were, you know, we didn't have the depth of, of craft that exists here in India, which was part of the reason we brought people from there. The coral limestone and the pigmented plaster were, were, were sort of two of them. But most of the rest of the island is agrarian. And, and why not? I mean, you're living, literally living in paradise where you can go out into the sea and catch you know, enough fish in a few hours for your family to eat for the next few days. And you can, you know, they rival India in terms of the quality of their mangoes and other fruits and things. So there's not the building culture. And so how do you then redesign or, or, or not even redesign, because I hadn't done it the first time, but how do you design for a, a space where you kind of have to strip away layers of craft that might be applicable here, but have no relation to to that environment um does that does that get to the question you're asking yes okay um so i had a question mm -hmm. 
so uh, you were talking about the clean for the lime. So you told the first one was failed and the second one uh, worked pretty fine. So what were the differences between the first one and the second one? How uh, actually you thought that, OK, this went wrong in the first one and it happened the second time. And adding to that, um, like um, um, in the school, you used few of the materials which were uh, reused. So suppose the doors and uh, so uh, you wanted to bring character to the space. So uh, what small details uh, did you add uh, to that particular thing so that the uh, character came upon uh, to the school other than the door itself? The door obviously has a strong character. But then did you add anything else to it for uh, the, um, like as a whole uh, gave uh, the narrative of the space? It, it was it something like that. Okay, so let me take those one at a time. Um, the first one to the, to the lime kiln, uh, we were a little bit too ambitious in the way that we stacked the, the stones and the way that they were arranged. Um, and so actually part of it collapsed, which didn't allow for the, the fire to continue to, to heat in the way that it needed to. And only a very, very small percentage of, of the stones actually um, were, were the, uh, the, the water was taken out um, to the degree we needed them to. Um, but the, the solution to that was to then look at, go back actually to an even more primitive form of kiln that was far more successful, even though it was sort of simpler. And so we, that was a kind of humbling process, but also something that we learned. Um, in terms of the character of, of the materials, we often, um, you know, try and let the materials bring the character for themselves. Um, the work that we make is, is you know, we, we not, we're not postmodern, but we are working after modernism and contemporary architecture. I believe in, in simplicity, in the kind of the, the beauty in, in simple forms um, and, and the character of, of material. Um, so what we tried to do, even the way that we furnished things, we tried to think about them um, also in a functional way. You know, we used char pies. If you saw the image with the green ceiling, there were char pies in that space, not because we said, oh, we should like put something in that like looks, you know, contextual, but because two girls could pick up a char pie and carry it out under a tree and sit and do their math homework. They could literally pick them up and stack them against the wall and have a dance recital or practice in the middle of the veranda. And so there was a very practical um, aspect to it, a very functional aspect to it. Um, and we wanted to create spaces that were really familiar for them. We knew it was the first time that they would be living away from home for the most part. And so the idea of broken mosaics, we imagined, and again, this was just a, a, something I made up in my head, but we imagined that they would have if, if they didn't have them in their home already, that they would have, their uncle or their cousin or their niece would have had that in their space or someplace in their community, they would have seen those. So they would be not something that you would typically see in an institutional environment, which this is. So we didn't want it to feel institutional. We wanted it to feel domestic and we wanted it to feel comfortable and familiar in certain ways. And so some of that was in the material choices, some of that was in the color choices. But the detailing and, and articulation, I think, was all fairly uh, simple and, and minimal and, and trying to sort of combat the, the, the kind of heaviness and the brutality of, of the concrete as a way to kind of soften it uh, for them, if that makes sense. Thank you, sir. Can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. So uh, I'm a recent graduate and um, after I've been working with a firm and uh, my doubt is with this kind of methodology, how do you really convince the clients to uh, uh, understand that uh, this is going to take some time? It might uh, fruit into a wonderful result, but, uh, uh, you know, working out of Mumbai and um, where people are all like, they always want something to be done as soon as possible. How do you really engage in that dialogue with clients to convince them for such uh, crafty things? You have to outwork them. 
and you have to uh, wear them out and wear them down and put in the, you have to produce the goods. So whether the goods are a full-scale mock-up on site, whether that's a particular kind of a drawing or a digital rendering or a physical model, you have to put in the work to demonstrate, communicate, specifically articulate, and share your idea in a way that, that captivates them and builds trust. I mean, I talked about a trust deficit that's true with, with anybody that you're collaborating with, if you're meeting them for the first time, but it's also true with clients. As much as they might like your work on Instagram or like what they've seen in magazines or things like that, at the same time, they only trust you kind of as far as they can throw you. So they're still the ones paying for it. And as a, as a practice and as a profession, we have an obligation to convince them that the ideas we're putting on the table in front of them are you know, not going to waste you know, thousands and thousands or lakhs or crores of their rupees. And so um, it's, it's, it's a lot of work and you don't always uh, win. You, <laughs> you don't always do that. But when the times that I've found where I just um, wasn't able to do it with, you know, with, with words or colorful languages or drawings alone, we, we actually, the design was the articulation of, communication. So we as architects don't make buildings. We don't make architecture. We make the things that represent architecture. And so we had to think about like, wow, that presentation where I made photorealistic digital renderings, that went terrible. So when I go to the next meeting, how am I going to get the client excited about what we do and how we work and say, okay, now I'm going to show them these are the mock-ups that we can do. These are you know, this is the this is an artifact that represents my idea, and you have to that that requires effort and resources and and yeah, sometimes sleepless nights. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Good evening. Oh, sorry. Uh, can I go ahead? Yeah, please. Sure. Um. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm a student and I'm currently pursuing my research thesis. And mm -hmm. I would like to know um, what is the main important stage in terms of collaboration between a designer and a craft person or an artisan in the project? Um, and uh, how do you communicate uh, like these ideas with them? So it depends on what the, you know, what they're doing. Uh, if you're talking about climate engineering, we had Pratik on board at a very early stage, as soon as we had a sense of massing. If you're talking about color, the building was nearly constructed or, or erected before Milena was really fully engaged with us. Um, some of the carpenters we worked with, we were, were developing a farmhouse in Kamshit. And as soon as we had a kind of viable plan that we wanted to explore, we worked with the carpenters to build a physical model, a large scale physical model where the people, the carpenters that we were working with to build the model would be the carpenters that were going to be erecting the timber part of the structure. And so in that sense, the value of that is that they're on the journey with you. They are involved in, they hear the client's feedback, they see your uh, design intent and they understand your drawings. They're also able to talk to you about, you know, joist sizes and spans and trusses and how, you know, pieces would be joined together and things like that. So they're giving your feedback, which informs your design, your design then informs their process. And as you go through that evolution together, it simplifies the construction stage. It makes it more efficient because maybe I don't need to have, maybe my physical model that that person themselves produced becomes the construction document so that I don't have to make, you know, an endless stack of AutoCAD drawings that, that sort of tries to do the same thing, but doesn't do it nearly as well. So you kind of have to understand what the role of, of that person or those people uh, is and figure out how to engage with them at the appropriate time.
Oh, yeah. Thank you. Sure. There's no silver bullet. There's no one answer, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Jessie, you want to go? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is very uh, uh, similar to what uh, the other person asked regarding the client and how do you, you know, convince them. But uh, this is uh, actually in relation to the community. So when you work with the community uh, and when you see them as clients, uh, the community also has like this aspirational values, right? And how do you like deal with that? Because there's always this uh, bias towards materials and, you know, techniques that we generally want them to accept but uh, uh, I don't know if there is actually uh, uh, if there is a match or a mismatch and have you dealt with that or how do you see that or have you not dealt with that at all when you say engage with the community you mean a community as clients as clients yes community as clients so in some ways it's not uh, it's not so different than engaging with um, a kind of a, a corporation or a bureaucratic kind of organization where you have sort of multiple people that you have to deal with. And um, it's very often that too many chefs spoil the broth. Um, one of my teachers sort of told a joke that if you ask 100 people whether they want it to be hot or whether they want it to be cold, they'll say we want it to be warm. And if you ask them what their favorite color is, they'll all give a different answer. And if you mix all those together, it'll be brown. And we all know what's warm and brown. So it's, um, you know, good design is not democratic, particularly. And so you have to understand as the sort of conductor of the orchestra, you have to understand um, how to take feedback, how to take criticism, how to take um, input and arrange that in a way that fits into an appropriate response. Now, that appropriate response might be about materials, it might be about climate, it might be about economy. Those are all things that all have to be dealt with. And so our job as architects is to try and manage and mitigate as many of those kind of layers as we possibly can all at the same time. But when you say community and, and community as clients, your role is to understand in general, not the individual feedback of a vast number of individuals, but what are the core values? What are the core needs, the requirements? And to try and understand those and, and meet them in a way that serves uh, the greater number of them in the best possible way. And that's a, kind of a general answer, but I think it might be the best I can do. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Sure. Yeah, anyone else? I have a so yeah. unrelated question, but uh, uh, when, when uh, now that uh, case goods and case design are uh, sort of working hand in hand as two entities. How does the the craft of collaboration um, take place on on the on the workshop floor, so to speak? Because when you are detailing at, at a product level, uh, the the values stay the same, but how does the, the practice um, carry ahead at the scale? That's a great question. Um, so yeah, just uh, in the last year or so, we have we have separated Case Goods into a separate company altogether. Um, Case Design is a is a partnership, and, and Case Goods is now a, a private limited company. Uh, that's sort of semantics to some degree, but um, we look at Case Goods as. Uh, again, driven by the act of making and, and collaboration with artisans and craftspeople. But we also look at both case design and case goods, but case goods especially as trying to 
uh, practice with contemporary craft. So we're not, that's not to say that we exclusively use, you know, hand carved timber work or that we exclusively use 3D printing and laser cutters and water jet. Um, we try and find a kind of balance between, there's no point in, in doing skilled or unskilled labor for the sake of doing labor. So in places where the appropriate response is to produce something mechanically, whether that's with a jig, whether that's with a machine, whether that's with CNC or whatever, um, we try and use appropriate tools in the appropriate context. So, you know, we have a workshop, we have a physical space of a workshop where we have technicians who have experience. We also engage with a lot of the same carpenters that we work with um, in terms of uh, for the architectural projects as well. But if you look at, um, and I didn't show them here tonight, but we recently, Duani actually recently produced a collection of, of jute duddies where the, the way that those were woven, we wanted to use jute because India produces 90% of the world jute. So we know that it's a material that's sustainable. We know that it's local. We know that there's a skill in weaving it. And we wanted to think about how we could dye that material with, with natural pigments. So she engaged with uh, an NGO in Andhra Pradesh she went to that place, she worked with those, she worked with the organization, she worked with the actual people doing the dyeing. We produced designs that were arrived at through the process and the technique that would be used to make it. So we didn't, we had some sense of, she had some sense of what she was after in terms of the outcome, but we also tried to let the process suggest to us how those designs might be manifested. So the way that they're dipped, the way that they're folded, the way that they're sort of uh, dried and all of those different kinds of things um, were really the drivers to the, the, the final product. And so a lot of time the, the craft comes, if you're talking about something as crafted, the craft comes not only in the production of the finished piece, but in the research and in the development, in the engagement with making samples and prototypes and understanding going back and forth. So it's very iterative. It's, it's about trial and error and understanding and, and, and developing. Um, you know, different products have different roles in that, obviously, and some things we've done a number of times. So there's a sort of shorter process in that. Um, you know, we developed a, a stacking metal chair where a lot of it was using very sort of advanced technical engineering, but because we wanted to produce them in lacs, not in, you know, small batches. And so you use a different set of skills in that process. But I, I, I think the way that you engage with the people who have those skills, whether it's cutting stone with a chisel or whether it's BIM modeling, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a similar engagement to rely on somebody who has a skill that you don't and understand their needs, constraints, expertise, and, and, and learn from that. Um, and it's it's quite fitting that um, given this this uh, value of contemporary craft that Case is carrying into, and uh, you guys are doing the eighty fifty trophy, which is <laughs> an emblem of Indian contemporary practice. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate that. It it was a fun. Um, uh, Greg, the former editor, was a was a good friend, and and that was one of the fun projects to 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 work on with him. Looking forward to to Komal's seeing Komal's uh, new role in that as well. Um, I I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Hi Samuel. So uh, to begin with, uh, I really love the work that you are doing with all these earthy materials and deep rooted techniques. Uh, however, I wonder that how do you manage to work in contextual diversity with different artisans, irrespective of language and culture differences? Also, I would uh, request you to put a limelight on the challenges that you face during the exploration and evolution of local techniques, contextual techniques, and material application. Um. Are you asking me how I learned Hindi? <laughs> no, 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 no. 
<laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, my, my Hindi is atrocious. It should, should be much better after 16 years of living here. But I, I No, India is that. actually, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, India is actually full of language diversity also. Yes. So it is not only about Hindi as well. Yep. No, for sure. No, it's it, it, a lot of it. One of the things that I love about, about practicing here in general, and aside to all the things I've already shared, is the enthusiasm that exists for people to communicate just in general. Um, I find where I'm from and in places, uh, especially in it's kind of a stereotype, I suppose, but cold climates, people tend to be a little bit more uh, introverted and reserved, but there's a great enthusiasm. You know, you can stop and ask somebody on the side of the road for directions and they'll give them to you even if they don't know where you want to go. Um, so it, it, I, I find the, the kind of, with, with a sincere effort to, to communicate, again, whether that's, whether that's gestures, whether that's broken language, whether that's sketches or, you know, um, different kinds of, of an expressing an idea, uh, one of the beautiful things here that I find is that the effort is always matched. And so that's made it a lot easier for, for me, uh, somebody from Michigan, to, to come into an environment like this and, and to, to feel welcomed, first of all, and, and to, be, uh, in, to, to find people who are very willing to engage um, on, on almost any kind of terms. Um, what was the second part of the question? Uh, so uh, it was that um, how do uh, what are the challenges that you face during the exploration and evolution of local techniques, contextual techniques, and material application? I mean, I suppose they're the same as the challenges of of, of any design practice. Um, I think what we maybe what it is is you know we create a bit of. Sometimes we create a bit of unnecessary work for ourselves in our in our enthusiasm to to not do something that we've done before. Um, I always tell people that you know where I where I'm from, you go to the hardware store and you or the the lumber yard and you pick out a two by four, a two by six, or a four by four, or whatever it was, and you have a standardized kit of parts that you can choose from, and all the effort to get to that point is already done for you but you're also limited in your selections. And if they don't have the size that you want, because you want something that's one and three quarters by seven and five eighths, then it's just not available or it is at, at extreme cost. Whereas here you might have the added responsibility to go find the tree itself or to go find a cut slab and get it cut or milled or planed into the size that you want. And so it requires that extra bit of effort but in that extra bit of effort, you get freedom because you have the full spectrum of anything that you can imagine, you can sort of work to, to sort of produce. Um, and sometimes that's exhausting, <laughs> the extra effort that goes into finding that like really unique special thing or, or having it made or, or engaging with the people that, that you need to, to help you make it. Um, but it also is incredibly rewarding in, in, in the lack of uh, limitations that it, that it offers. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I, can I ask you one more question? Of course. Yeah, so um, what do you think is the importance of uh, star architects in uh, contemporary craft? Um, I don't think there is. Uh, any importance in star architects in general. Uh, the notion of, of a star architect, if they're a good architect, that's great. If they're willing to engage and produce meaningful work, that's great. The way that somebody is made into a star or becomes a star is completely independent of the work that they produce, in my opinion. So it's, a, it's another layer that society and culture and magazines and media add on to the thing. So if you really like the work of somebody that nobody's ever heard of, and you think that it's meaningful, then that's incredible. And if you really love the work of Zaha Hadid, that's also great. Uh, she produces incredible, or she, while she was living, she produced incredible work. Peter Zumthor produces incredible work. Studio 6A produces incredible work. 
the layers of of attention that they get or don't get for me is is secondary. Um, that's part of the sort of media and publishing um, empire. Yeah, and uh, what do you think um, is the importance of academia in architectural practice? Um, oh, that's a great question. I think it's. I think it can be uh, uh, really, really fantastic. Um, my uh, my thesis advisor, and and I think he actually was on reviews at except not too long ago. A guy named Perry Cooper, who currently teaches at University of Michigan. So he was my thesis advisor when I was at SciArc. He's an old old friend. He was at uh, Erica and, and my wedding. Um, you know, he's, he's practiced architecture, but for the last, you know, 30 years or so, he's been in, in academia and, and the thinking that he does, the drawings that he produces, the things that he, he make are, are unimaginable by, by somebody like me. They're just incredible. I'm, I'm astounded by them and the way that he engages with students. Um, and so from the point of view of, of, of research, whether it's theoretical research, whether it's practical technological research, um, whether it's you know the development of of um, different ways of of either practicing, like I think at this point uh, a good portion of the students who graduated from SciArc, the school that I went to, go and work in the film industry, um, and so some of the best architects right now practicing are the ones who are designing sets for Star Wars and for The Hobbit and for all of those kinds of things. And so um, I think it's, I think academia is incredibly important. I think it's a place where people get exposed to ideas that are, are uh, can be very pertinent to professional practice, but also what's important is that they're exposed to ideas that are not possible in professional practice. And I think that opening of of people's minds and, and that exploration um, can be incredible for, for um, practitioners and academics alike. Thank you. Sure. I think we will sort of uh, close the session, but I, but I think uh, right from Abhishai to Jayashree to, to many of you, the kind of questions that, that you all raised and Samuel's response to some of the questions uh, is worth to think about. So let me say that, uh, that uh, practice where, uh, where you have collaboration and where, uh, the, where at different stages appropriate to what, what that time demands from the, from the collaborator, uh, you keep on improvising, uh, so it's like what Samuel was talking about. When, when once you engage with the craftsman, the idea is there. The craftsman builds up further. Then you go back, refine the idea, and this process of continuous collaboration and empathy, and trying to understand and and seeing a value is it becomes important. So long as it doesn't become, let's say, a collage, but sometimes collages are very meaningfully done. So. Uh, so sometimes those rules would be valid, sometimes one doesn't, but obviously once something comes out, uh, it is being tested constantly. If you look at the nature of the practice, one of the things which is extremely important for us to learn is that the way different kinds of skills in a local client or let's say a local geography, et cetera, is sort of put together with the larger knowledge as well. So it is certain degree of localness and certain degree of, of maybe universal, I may, uh, if I have to use that word. But, but if you look at the practice from its profession point of view, you look uh, what Abhishek was asking the question becomes important because, uh, because there's a practice who is also looking at uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, and this is, this is very important for us to understand that, that uh, that uh, that architecture and and therefore uh, and it's it's allied whatever you want or maybe any product design and it's allied whatever you want to call it uh, cannot lead to drudgery of labor. I mean you understand that um, and therefore this this uh, 
at, at one point of time, because I have been engaging and documenting a lot about craftspeople, uh, and, and sometimes we over-celebrate and uh, that it becomes a drudgery. Okay, because, so, so at one hand, a practice like him is also trying to cultivate and, and trying to support some of the things which otherwise may not remain after a few years because, um, because of the challenges of a lot of things which I don't want to get into the discussion, but, but fundamentally, uh, um, we are at the cusp in India and maybe some of the parts of the world uh, where this question of how much hand and how much machine and how much one needs to bodily do as, as something which is for living versus something which is for, for, for its own personal need are being tested constantly. Um, not only they are being tested, perhaps we may be some of the last generations where we are seeing our living artisans who can still work with hands in the way you imagine it, uh, at least in the way I am documenting this country. Uh, sooner, uh, sooner there will be new ways to look at it. I'm not saying good, I'm not saying bad. I'm saying this is what the context uh, is sort of uh, is sort of there for all of us. The other thing which, if you learn, is what I, I really appreciate uh, when Samuel was presenting it: the simplicity with which things comes in, but there is a deep dis discipline to it. Okay, so if you look at it, there is a, there is always a give and take, there is a play, but you'll find there is a discipline, but it gives you that ease. It's not stressed. Um, and in spite of the fact that you'll find a lot of efforts are being done with various agencies to come, but it's not easy. Many, why we don't do many things in, in practice and why do we want something to be done in Mumbai yesterday is because line plaster needs to be done by yesterday. Why is it taking, taking today to do it or 10 days to do it? What it also means is, is, the, is that some of this practice becomes important to understand that buildings are not eternal. And, and to be aware about the fact that, that when the act of the building itself is the act of maintaining, the act of changing like, like our body. Uh, and so there is nothing like 100%, uh, you know, this eternal sort of building like a thing because it's a physical thing and it needs, it leaves its own life because material leaves its own life. Um, the simplicity, the simplicity also comes because see, if you look at the, for us to sort of think about it, before this, we have been seeing a great effort in trying to make everything so neat that, that you feel, sometimes you feel that either the technique is so well worked out that, that, that you have cracked that technology to do it, or it will take so much time to do that kind of a work. If you look at some of the exposure, but here I think again I saw a balance. I saw that uh, there was there was certain degree of ease in trying to explore the space, uh, trying to give up, but at the same time you will see that certain areas there was efforts to sort of uh, uh, sort of work out. For example, the stone masonry was remarkable. Okay, if you look at look at it, but if you look at the casting of the of the slabs, etc., you see it. You will see that the textures were there. So you see that the, when the agencies are coming, if you look at the drawings, then these agencies based on their knowledge are negotiating, okay? And one of the agency transfers the knowledge to the other agency, you will find, I mean, you, if, if you start looking at it, you'll find with, with, with your eyes that this is happening, but you'll also find how things are being orchestrated, okay? And that's why I said that there's a discipline, but it's a ease, it's a simplicity, but but uh, but the, but at the same time also if you look at the plan you know it's like a case it's a box you do a beautiful box and perhaps it will it will sort of um, serve a lot and in the end I think uh, we also need to learn the nature of the practice that he has built up okay and and they have built up let me let me say that and that's fundamentally important uh, uh, let me put it here that uh, as an open sort of Forum. Uh, let me put it here that when you bring multiple agencies, there are finances involved. Uh, there are because because obviously uh, it's uh, you have to look at it in in certain way. There is also there is also an example of an ecosystem of practice where specifics are done. Some of the things are moved to 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 a level of entrepreneurship, and some of them are explored, added, moved to the new one. And I think that's a that's a remarkable example to sort of for all of us to to reflect and think that there is a possibility to practice, 
and there is also a possibility uh, to sort of balance things out. Okay, so uh, I hope Sam, next time we, we should be able to invite you in the campus if you are free. Uh, I would love but, to. But it was wonderful to have you. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we'll Thank sign you. off. Tomorrow will be the last session with Robert. Okay. You should you should all be there. Robert's a fantastic architect. He used to be my neighbor and, and he's a good friend. So he, they do lovely work. Thanks a lot. Good night. Take care. Take care. Thank you.